Philip, I have been obsessed with the mind-body problem my whole life, even getting a PhD in brain science. I don't know if that helped me at all. Uh, I have been talking to different people about how they view the solutions. What are the different kinds of solutions? How do you see it? The study of mind has been revolutionized in recent years by our ability to see in real time what's occurring in the brain. So I can ask a monk to meditate, to go into a particular intentional mental state, and then I can find out in real time what his brain is doing and how it's unlike others. I think that has moved us beyond some of the outlier positions, a complete reductionism where intention does nothing, but also I think it's moved us beyond the soul-based positions, that something mystical and mysterious of a supernatural soul is at work. We are in, in an age of embodied, embedded mind, mental intentions which do things in the brain and tight, tight correlations between what the brain is occurring in the brain and what these intentions are. Okay, now the latter point is certainly used by a large number of neuroscientists to say that that's all there is. You don't have to go further than that. You've said it. You've made my position. I don't even have to argue. You've now just said that the, the, the mind is just the brain. There's no mind-body problem. Everything was all an illusion to begin with. And the, the, the mind is just some manifestation of what's happening in the brain. What's really important is to separate the scientific results from the ideologies or philosophies that they often come embedded in. So when uh, a scientist says it all will be answered in terms of individual neurons, the science doesn't dictate or require that. In fact, it seems to me much more plausible that what we are is the functioning of these complex brains giving rise to emergent properties, properties that you and I are aware of, the properties of, of seeing, feeling, sensing, and then the interactions with other persons on the level of human social interaction. So that becomes a critical factor in solving the mind problem. You cannot deal with it without some of these very higher level interactions. Yeah. That's not something that's a consequence, but something that is an integral part of the solution. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. yeah. Once complicated systems like the brain have produced these str admittedly strange properties, like the dreaming of world peace or wanting a chocolate milkshake, right? Once you have a brain that's able to entertain ideas such like, such as that, then you have the possibility of a new kind of empirical study. The empirical study of the interaction between these emergent properties and the substratum, the brain that produces them. And it turns out that these are not merely dictated by and determined by what occurs at the level of the brain, but there's an interaction between holistic states and individual firings. But you need nothing extra into the equation. No spirit, no soul, no mystical energy, or is nothing. Yeah. It's a position a lot of us are calling broad naturalism. A naturalism which, which still looks at the way that evolution has produced creatures like us, but also understands that what we are as social creatures raising these broader questions and spending much of our life uh, um, motivated by thoughts that go well beyond our immediate biological context. As a philosopher, would you call this property dualism? No, I resist that term. Property dualism... Now, somebody listening to what you say would seem to put that, that, that uh, uh, title on it. Let, no? Let's make it worse. I'm not a property dualist. I'm a property pluralist. The natural world produces an amazing variety of properties over the stages of evolution. To be a property dualist would be to act as if everything in evolution up to the existence of the first human mind was just one kind of property. And then, boom, we had conscious properties. That's a complete fallacy. Evolution is always producing new kinds of properties. Sure, consciousness is a pretty strange one, but it's not the first time there's been a difference. So how, how many are we talking about? We're talking about three to five? We're talking about 100 billion. I mean, how many different kinds of these properties are in your property pluralism? I've heard uh, experts come up with as many as 28 distinct levels of evolution. To me, that's silly. We can't get such fine-grained in, as analysis. But clearly, however many properties there are in physics, when you have systems on which natural selection operates, after all, that's the kind of system that produced our brain, you have other kinds of properties. Living organisms have different kinds of properties in various interesting ways. 
than purely physical systems. And consciousness being only one of this group or consciousness being the most important, uh, the most, the strangest one? Uh, how would you classify consciousness among these uh, pluralistic uh, 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 properties. Well, there you go again, Robert, dichotomizing on me. I'm trying to. <laughs> so, and but I absolutely resist it. I think it's not empirically adequate. So let's, let's talk now out of biological systems about how cultural dynamics emerge. The fact that there's a distinct culture of groups of birds or of apes or chimpanzees. Now there's another kind of property, which is not Darwinian. Technically, it's called Lamarckian because it allows for the inheritance of acquired characteristics. See, I'm not sure if whether you avoided my question or not, so I'm going to ask it again. Yeah. And maybe we'll see if we can, we, we can, if, if I can understand it. I'm asking, is consciousness per se fundamentally different in kind from these other kinds of pluralistic properties that you say evolution created? I'd say no. It is yet one new difference in kind. All the ones I've mentioned, through culture, and now we've got yet another one. The fact that you have a sense of what it is to be yourself. Right. The fact that each of us is, or in part, is a person as a whole. It's a self-awareness. It's yeah. an aware that we're having this conversation. I'm looking at myself in my mind's eye, seeing us having this conversation. We have a constant inner dialogue going on. I'm imagining what are you thinking, what, what are you interpreting. I'm trying to interpret your behaviors in light of that projection. A, a, a whole world of these sort of emergent co conscious properties. That's what we inhabit as, her, as humans. Oh, okay, but what you're saying is that this, this capacity that we all have is not something fundamentally different than a whole series of others, whatever they may be, I don't really care at this point, but you're saying it's part of a, of a, of a, of a spectrum yeah. of different kinds of properties, pluralistic properties that have been emergent. Yeah. Yet one more stage in this fascinating process of evolution. I admit that this property, uh, the properties called mental properties, I have some pretty strange features compared to biology or physics. The property of imagining gods, of, of imagining futures, of transposing myself through time. Nonetheless, that's an emergent property of a complicated natural system.